OK. Well, well, it's yours, uh, Daniel. Thank you, uh, Mark. So let me share you my presentation. OK. So uh, can you see my screen? Uh, no. OK. Um, da, 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 da. Ah, huh. OK. Can you see it now? Yes. My, uh, as um, Mark said, uh, I, I used to be a student like you uh, at uh, x Data, Data Science for Business. And before that, uh, I'm graduate from Polytechnic as well. And I worked at the office of the CTO at Microsoft Friends. And currently, I'm working on a startup around um, the securization of the company data sharing when this, uh, they share the data to external third parties. So it's linked to what I'm going to present to you. And so, uh, to introduce the subject, uh, I like to show you this meme, but the idea is that today we talk a lot about machine learning, but uh, if we do not uh, have some ways to protect the data, some machine learning models that are beautiful in theory cannot be used in practice. For instance, if you uh, want to analyze, for instance, uh, people's uh, personal data or medical data or even financial, you have a problem because you will need to show this data to someone else. And I don't know if you, for instance, if some of you for bought some cryptocurrency, but if you buy cryptocurrency, you need to show uh, a photo of your passport. And it's a huge problem because uh, if, uh, if you show the, your passport to someone and for instance, they get hacked or they are not, um, uh, what can I say, they do not respect the law, uh, your identity can be stolen. And this can be a serious issue when you transfer this kind of uh, critical information. And that's why uh, today there is a, a new emerging thing around privacy preserving machine learning that is based on machine learning, but also cryptography. And so uh, today I will show you uh, a little introduction about the, the context on the, uh, on the threats that we have, especially on the cloud. And then we'll see three uh, techniques, federal share computing, homomorphic encryption, and secure multi secure multi-party computation. And if you have time, we can have a look at differential privacy, which is orthogonal to those methods. Uh, you will see this presentation comes from my internship at Microsoft. So um, you can both find it online and uh, you will see some mentions to Microsoft. I'm not like uh, trying to say Microsoft at all, but given that this material was already existing, I adapted it. And uh, so there can be some links to Microsoft, but do not see this as a kind of like advertisement. Um, so, to give you a more idea about uh, the context, uh, you know that data, push, data breaches happen a lot, and especially uh, it has been accelerating. Uh, for instance, uh, there are with several breaches, and even recently, uh, I didn't put it on these uh, slides, but um, it happened with Dr. Lib, for instance, where 6,000 6, uh, accounts were leaked. And uh, the problem was not so much about Dr. Lib, but a partner of Dr. Lib. And this partner did not have as much security as Dr. Lib, and so those accounts were leaked. But what, what was problematic was that uh, there was information about the nature of the, um, uh, of the apartment. So like if you go see, uh, I don't know, like uh, some um, a cardiologist, you know, this, even if uh, there were no direct medical data involved, if you, because the, the hackers knew the nature of the meeting, they could guess that some people had some kind of disease. So you see, it's, it's very uh, important today to secure this. And um, you know that this just give you like a little bit of a, a few figures about this, but you see that you can have a look at it later, but uh, it's huge figures. Like uh, for instance, uh, we, we, um, usually it takes like an average Seven uh, between six and seven millions to uh, to remediate uh, a breach, so it's a, it's a very serious issue. And now I'm going to talk more about the data and news aspect. What is what do I mean by data and news? I mean that you can secure the data. I will, we'll see that later. But you can secure data uh, when it's uh, at rest, which means when you do not use it. You can secure it when you move it, but Usually, there have been no methods to secure it while it is used in a program. And the thing is, you are exposed to many different uh, threats. For instance, if, uh, if the guest OS you use is malicious, if the host is malicious, if the hypervisor, which is um, a kind of, this kind of manager uh, for your VMs, for instance, if you use AWS, there will be a, a hypervisor 
that will manage uh, the VMs for you. And you can see that there are very there are a lot of threads that come from a lot a lot of different um, angles. So you need to be able to secure this if you want to trust an app that will use your data, especially in the cloud. So the first solution we will see is called confidential computing. And so, uh, as I told you before, you can secure the data uh, when it's in your hard drive, for instance, you can uh, encrypt this. So if, you, if once some comes and steals your laptop, uh, if you don't have the key, you cannot uh, actually decrypt uh, the contents. You can also uh, encrypt your data when it's, um, when it's in transit, for instance, with HTTPS, when you do a payment online and all. But the big issue now is how to encrypt this during uh, computation. Because if you think about it, how can you, com how can you do computation on encrypted data? Yeah, actually, I don't think you know any way. And it's a problem so because already, uh, um, as of today, when you need to, you can secure, for instance, a bank can secure the transfer of data to, uh, to one um, partner. But even if the transfer is secure, as long as this partner will need to use the data, uh, perform computation on it and all, he will need to decrypt the data. So he will have a copy of your data uh, uh, in his um, can I say, data warehouse. And so it becomes another point of failure if ever this partner uh, is hacked. And because we do not know how to un uh, do computation on encrypted data before, this kind of um, issues happen a lot. So as I said before, you need, if you think about this, there are a lot of ways to be hacked. Yeah. You can, uh, people often think about the application that, is, uh, that has a vulnerability, but it can also come from the, uh, the OS, the hypervisor, the OS, the hardware. So someone, uh, even someone that, has, that can just see, um, that can measure what is, for instance, uh, uh, the electric consumption of your, uh, of your VM uh, can have information about you. So you see that you can be uh, attacked on many different uh, uh, channels. So it's important to have something that is um, trustable. And so the first technology we see is called confidential computing and is based on Intel SGX. Uh, Intel SGX is, uh, is, a new uh, is a new kind of uh, CPU that uh, Intel provides now. So it's a, it's a special hardware. And from high level overview, what it allows you to do is for an operator, that means that someone that, uh, that just wants, uh, that is a third party, that is, does not necessarily need, need to see the data or the code, uh, while the, the, this operator can allow the execution of code that is encrypted on data that is encrypted. That means that, for instance, you could be a patient and you have like um, a medical data, so you don't want to show it to someone else. And on the other hand, there could be like um, an hospital that has a model that wants to use on your data and they do not want to show it to the, uh, to the patient because there's IP behind this, you know that with machine learning, uh, those models have a lot of value. So you do not want to allow people to see a model. So with this kind of uh, operator, this operator using uh, what we will see later, which is called enclaves, it can take the data, it can take the code and apply the code on the data without ever seeing uh, either of those. So this operator cannot see what happens. Think of this, uh, I don't know, like a Swiss bank, something like that. And the result uh, is uh, also encrypted and can be given either to the data owner, the code owner, or a third party. And let's see how it works uh, in more detail. So I talked about enclaves. The particularity of the Intel SGX hardware is that it allows you to create what we call enclaves. Enclaves are parts of your memory, of the memory of the, uh, of the machine that is isolated from the rest. What does it mean? It means that neither the OS or the hypervisor can see what is inside an enclave. It's encrypted. It's a special... Um, Process, uh, program that is isolated from the rest. And uh, that, that means that, for instance, if, if the VM is hosted on Azure or uh, Google or GCP, the, uh, neither Google or Microsoft can see what happens inside. And if they, even if they try to dump it, they cannot see what, uh, what is inside because the dump will be encrypted. And also, it is, um, uh, you cannot tamper with the hardware, which means that even if someone is trying to listen to the hardware, it will not know what happens inside. So it's very interesting. So this way you can put, you can host code on the cloud or on those machines, and you can know that the host, the, the cloud provider, will not know what happens. That's the first part. That's the first part, and uh, the interesting part after that um, is that uh, you can you can create a, you can have a, a secure part of your if a code 
which needs to like decrypt the data. For instance, apply a machine learning uh, model uh, in this um, on your data, and then there is a host which like um, acts, uh, which can be can I say, uh, which can be the server. The server, uh, the server does not need to see what happens, and that is that you have an enclave, and the first, uh, the first, as I told you, the host cannot see what happens inside. But uh, the host uh, will be the one who uh, directs the message. And that we will see uh, in the next slide something that is called attestation. And the idea of attestation is that before you send data to uh, the enclave, you need to make sure that the enclave is uh, initially set up. So what you do is that you can attest uh, that the uh, enclave is uh, has the right code inside, the right data, because you have a hardware way. There are secrets that are written on the hardware that allows you to verify that the code that you think you're talking to is the right one. So that's why you need special kind of hardware. But with this uh, functionality, you can see that, OK, you want to have your data analyzed by someone else. The first thing you do is that you make sure that the program you're talking to is the right one with the right data, with the right code. And once you, are, you know that it, uh, it has been properly initialized, then you can create a secure uh, communication uh, channel and send your data through this. And in that case, the host which is like uh, Microsoft, will help you set up the, uh, will, will just like forward the data. But you know, I don't know if you know about this, but there are ways to create a, a secure communication uh, channel without, uh, without uh, what can I say, transferring the secrets. And so that means that Microsoft will not know the secret key that you would use in your communication with the enclave. And so uh, you, can, you can still uh, transmit message encrypted and only the enclave would be able to decrypt this. So this way, uh, you can first uh, attest that the code is, uh, is the right one. And once it's done, you create a secure communication channel. And then you send the data. The enclave will be the only one who can decrypt your data. And the host will not see what is inside. And then uh, the enclave will do the computation, uh, encrypt this, send it back to you. And the host will never see uh, what was the data that was transmitted. And as I said, the very uh, interesting property is what we call attestation, remote attestation. Uh, I'm showing you the, like uh, a presentation because it's, it helps with an example, but uh, this is a feature which, is, uh, which enables you to, uh, to prove, uh, if you have a cryptographic proof that the enclave is, um, is set up uh, with the right code and the right data. And this is a very interesting feature that you do not usually see uh, because you, uh, today, when you uh, transfer data to someone, you do not, you cannot actually check what is the code behind. And with this, you can check that the the, uh, the portion of the code that will uh, perform analysis on your data can be checked before you can send it, and you can make sure that the code is a law. You know, like uh, just like uh, I don't know if you know about smart contract, but it's kind of the same feeling about this. Is that you can make sure you're talking to code. And you know that uh, you can check the code before you send data. So this is a very interesting and important feature of uh, confidential computing. And with that, you can see that uh, you can create a, a lot of interesting use case. First, you can uh, take your existing applications and uh, make it leverage uh, confidential computing so that they, uh, they, do, they do not actually see the data. One simple example is, for example, when you use uh, CRMs. Well, actually, when you use a CRM, the company does not need to see your data. They have to provide you a service, but does Salesforce need to know the, ex the exact name of your customers? No, they just need to give you a good experience, a good service. So those companies could, uh, in, the in theory, implement this kind of uh, technologies so that they can provide you uh, the same service, but they can give you the guarantee that they will never see your data in clear. And also, uh, as I said, you can create new customer, uh, customer uh, workloads around blockchain, uh, machine learning, IoT, and all. And at last, uh, there will be a scenario we'll cover later, which is, for instance, how to do multi-party uh, machine learning and how you, we can have different actors collaborating uh, with different uh, interests. Daniel? Yes? So there is a question on the chat. Uh, can you give us a, a real-world example of an enclave model, uh, for instance? Uh, I will, as I will be a demo and an example later. So uh, I will uh, come back to this uh, very soon. Okay. I'm just giving you like uh, the, the, the tools for you to understand this. Right. Um, and so now I'm more, I will more talk about the developer, development experience if you want to uh, do this. 
there are several possibilities. First one we will see that uh, is that to use a. Uh, the thing is, uh, if you want to use enclaves, you need to uh, code in low level. That means you need to do C++. There is an SDK called Open Enclave that will cover later, but it's rather low level. And that's if you want to code it yourself. But more interesting for you, you can also use lift and shift models. What does it mean? It means that you, you can load an, uh, a small OS within the enclave that allows you then to put a Python script or like a, any kind of a software that you have already written and you do not need to refactor it to use uh, the open enclave SDK. We'll have a demo about that later. And finally, um, that's something that, uh, that's possible. You can have managed, managed services that use enclaves so that you do not actually need to like, uh, uh, yeah, take a, a do the remote station, et cetera. So you can benefit from this without actually need, uh, needing to like uh, dig, dig into the code. So the first uh, option, if we go into more detail, it's, uh, it's, uh, it is to use the open enclave SDK. This is the most uh, optimized option, but also the most, um, complex one, because as, you, as I said, you need to use a C++. Uh, you need to set up yourself uh, the, um, the, low, the low level uh, API calls, and et cetera. So it's possible. Uh, actually, you can use it uh, as it is. It's uh, kind of mature. But uh, yeah, you, we, you see that uh, it's not trivial to use. Something that is more interesting for you, and we will, I will show, give you a demo afterwards, is, as I said, using uh, like um, lightweight OS so that you can load uh, existing code, like Python scripts and all. You can even load uh, PyTorch or even Docker images with, um, with this uh, uh, lightweight OS. And for instance, we see uh, how it works in practice with uh, a library called Graphene EGX. Graphene EGX is a library that allows you to use uh, like uh, PyTorch and all and directly uh, within an enclave. So you, you do not need to refactor your code and can still use um, uh, the security properties of, uh, of Fedasha computing. So I will uh, uh, share my screen now. Just a moment. Uh, okay. So, um, oh, wait. Mm. A moment, I will share the, the console. Okay, do you see um, do you see my screen? Yes, but can you make it perhaps a little bit uh, bigger? Uh, this is it's already like um, yeah, it's it's better. Yeah, like this, it's better. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, I will show you. Uh, wait. I'll show you the thing. So here, uh, I'm, I will use Graphin to show you how you can use PyTorch with uh, Photoshop computing. So the first thing I do is uh, I will download the model. I showed you before, the, the goal will be, will be to classify an image using uh, Photoshop computing. So I showed you, I don't know if you remember in the slide, but I showed you a picture of a, of a dog. And the, the goal will be to predict what kind of dog it is. So first, I download uh, the PyTorch model. So I, first, I will show you the, the usual way, so which is you execute the script. And we have a result file. And if you look at the result file, you have the classes um, of your um, uh, the, no, the, the prediction scores. So here it says that the most likely class, uh, the most likely race is Labrador. So OK, that's uh, so I will um, now I will use um, computing. So how does it work is that uh, in Graphene, you have to provide what they call a manifest. We see how, uh, what it looks like. The manifest is a, um, is a configuration file that tells uh, that uh, enables, enables you to, uh, to say what kind of, um, of uh, com uh, computation you want to do. For instance, here we say, OK, we're going to use a uh, Python. Uh, we, we provide uh, arguments for the common line, so it's not secure, but it's for demo, demo purposes. And for instance, here they, uh, you give um, you say how you will replace the uh, the C calls that are usually done with PyTorch with the custom ones from Graphene. So it's just more like a, it's more like a setup files, but just so you have an idea how it works. And so what I will do is uh, I will create the enclave, uh, do a make, and now uh, let me. Uh, use it so it's 
PyTorch.manifest. And then the idea is that with this command, what I will do is that I will run the PyTorch script that I showed you earlier, but in an enclave. So, well, actually, what I'm doing is not secure, but uh, just to give you an idea. And as, as before, you see that there is a result that txt file that appeared. And I can see what is inside, and it's exactly the same result. But the difference here is that in this time, well, you didn't see much, but this time, this uh, program was, uh, was used in an enclave, which means that if you give the proper like infrastructure, someone could, uh, for instance, uh, attest first the model that you have put inside the enclave, and then send the data encrypted to the enclave, and the enclave will be able to run the model and give you the result uh, encrypted. Here, the result is in the plain text, but uh, if you have the proper infrastructure, you can do this all uh, encrypted. So that means that uh, the, um, the client will not need to, show, uh, to actually show the real data. It can only show the encryption of the data, and you can still use a PyTorch model on this. So, but yes. Daniel, mm -hmm. so here you are saying you are using uh, Python, but uh, I mean, uh, under the hood in uh, PyTorch, it's uh, C++ code. Yeah. So yeah. So, as I said before, uh, in the manifest file, they gave you uh, the, the idea of graphene is that they replace all uh, low level calls with uh, ones that are uh, compatible with enclaves. So, you're, you're using PyTorch and uh, it's transparent for you. But actually, what they, uh, what they did is in the graphene project is that uh, to make this um, experience uh, transparent, uh, when you're using the, the, the enclave, uh, all the calls have been replaced with one that are like uh, enclave uh, compatible. So for you, it's, it's as if you use PyTorch, but in fact, it's, uh, it's not. It's, uh, it's meant okay. especially for the enclaves. Okay, thanks. So that's an example. Well, uh, uh, this, this library is not like um, production ready yet. It's still uh, in development, but uh, it can show you what can potentially be done in the future. So. Uh, uh, there's also um, an um, initiative uh, done by uh, Microsoft, which is called AJAX ACL, which is another uh, OS. But with uh, AJAX ACL, you can even run Docker images within enclaves. So you see, it's uh, it's coming. Uh, I don't, I think like within a year or something like that. But it's coming. You can or you can think that you, maybe in the future, if you want to do something that is like uh, privacy related, you can you do not actually need to refactor your code. So that's uh, the little uh, example here. So I will go back to the slides. Uh, OK. OK, do you see my screen? Uh, yes, so here it's, uh, I mean, uh, the only case of application is for inference, right? There is no learning. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Good question. We'll see about this uh, very soon, just after okay. that. So, okay. uh, yeah, just as I said before, uh, it's still in alpha, but it's possible in the future that you, you can uh, use uh, Docker images with containers. So that uh, they're working on uh, using, uh, on making it like a Kubernetes, uh, like a, Compliant, so it's uh, one area of development. So you do not actually need to like do a C plus plus code to use that. And so, as I said, now the interesting part is how does it relate to machine learning in more specific ways. The thing that is interesting is that with computational uh, computing, you can do you can address multi-party machine learning case. Does it mean that uh, it's possible that several parties, like different hospitals or a hospital and a pharmaceutical company can pull together the data and train a model uh, together without having to show to uh, each other the data they have. And uh, at the end, they can all benefit from the trained model. So uh, this is an example uh, I will show you. This is something that uh, I've, uh, we worked a little bit on at Microsoft, but um, it's still something that is in development. But you can really imagine uh, a setup where you have different hospital and that pull the data and the so data is encrypted with uh, each people's key, and uh, it will only be decrypted in an enclave uh, so that uh, the keys are never shown to another party. So that's why we can train it together. Unfortunately, uh, I could have shown you the demo, but I do not access to the machines anymore because I'm no longer at Microsoft. 
but uh, this, uh, this, chef, uh, this, this, uh, this illustration can, give, can tell you how it works. And one interesting thing is that even if the data is uh, non-homogeneous, which means maybe some guy has like uh, 4K images, uh, another guy has like uh, 1K images, uh, and they're not like um, uh, homogeneous, what you can do is that uh, people first do the pre-processing on their part, and so that uh, the, the final data is, uh, is the same. And at the end, you, uh, you merge those uh, outputs together in an enclave, and then you do the training together. So you can aggregate um, everything together. And because you can attest what happens in each enclave, you can really create a, a, a chain of trust between parties, and they can like, um, homogenize the data without having to show it to uh, those people or what, uh, what they are doing to the data or what was the initial data. So it's very interesting to learn. Uh, it's not only about inference, but also about training. So that's a very interesting property. And we'll see that not every technology allows training today. So this is, uh, if you are not more interesting about this, you have a lot of uh, literature that you can cover. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's pushed by Microsoft Research, but also Google uh, on this. Those that do not uh, provide the enclave support, Currently, uh, IntelliJX is only uh, available on the Azure marketplace, and it's, uh, there are no cloud providers or those than Microsoft. So that was um, official computing. Um, I can take questions on this uh, topic uh, now before I move on to another technique. So if you have questions, uh, do not hesitate. Any question from the audience? So you, you are saying, I mean, uh, so this is provided as a service on Azure, this? Uh... You can, we can rent uh, VMs with IntelliJX, with the special processor that I talked about. So currently, there are a few, uh, how can I say, um, applications that, are, that already use uh, Enclave, for instance. Uh, there is uh, something called the uh, Microsoft SQL always encrypted which means that um, some colons, for instance, age, um, I don't know, uh, bank account, something like that, are encrypted so that Microsoft does not see what is inside. But for you, who has like hosted this data on, uh, on Microsoft, you can still do like um, queries on the data, on the encrypted data. Uh, for instance, yeah, uh, joins, uh, equality uh, operations on the, those columns. And Microsoft does not know what is inside. But what you can do is even you can decrypt the columns in an enclave and perform like um, uh, equality comparisons or inequality compar uh, comparisons on these columns without Microsoft knowing what is inside. So in this way, you can more easily trust the cloud because the data is always encrypted to Microsoft eyes, but to you, you can still use it as a regular database. So that's uh, one example of thing that is exist. But currently, if you want to, uh, if you want to use it for like more custom purposes, for instance, if you want to develop on this, as I said, you can either use Open Enclave, which is really hard to use, to be honest, or you can use a uh, Graphene or AJAX AKL, but they are not ready yet. So currently, the only thing that you can use today to tackle like real use cases is that you, you code yourself in Open Enclave. But honestly, it's a pain in the ass and, and doing this, it, it's, not, it's not fun. But you can see that in the future, within a year or two years, it's because it's something that is highly um, active. You can imagine running like a, a Docker images in Enclave. Okay, then I have a, a, a more meta question. I mean, uh, who is contributing to this project? Is it an open source project or is it only uh, funded by uh, Microsoft? Uh, well, the, the project is called Open Enclave, so there are other actors like Google, uh, Intel, and like uh, those uh, other people. So the so Open Enclave is an open source project. Uh, Graphene is an open source project. SGX LKL is also an open source project. Uh, but um, well, Open Enclave and SGX LKL are like, um, it's, uh, what can I say, heavily uh, invested by Microsoft. But Graphene is, uh, there are different people from different backgrounds. So, well, uh, Microsoft contributes to this, but it's not like it's something that is under the Microsoft uh, GitHub repository, for instance. Okay. So and uh, anybody can check the code then. I mean, yeah, sure. Uh, that's, that's a point. That's, that's the whole point of being. Uh, mm. Okay. 
thanks. Is there, if there is no... Uh, I have one question. question. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, Daniel, can you please talk about uh, what types of problem can happen in uh, trusted execution environments like Intel SGX? Uh, what types of attacks can happen so that we understand why we move to homomorphic encryption? Well, the thing, the problem with Intel SGX is that it's a hardware solution. That means that there are attacks that are known, for instance, uh, what we call side channel attacks, which, uh, for instance, uh, just by, even if an operator, if they do query on this, if they look at, your, at the time it takes to respond, uh, you can deduce something. It means that, for instance, I don't know if you know this, but uh, if you uh, imagine you're coding in Python and you say, okay, if password is equal uh, blah, 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 uh, the time it takes to answer uh, gives you information. For instance, if you say, uh, if the letter A first at the first letter, the thing is Python will say, okay, the first letter, is, it, is the first letter B? Uh, if not, uh, it, will say, it, will, it will directly say you it's the uh, wrong password. But uh, if, uh, if the first letter you take is B, which is in blah, 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 uh, it will look at the second letter and check if the second letter is L or not, and it will continue like this. What I mean by that is that the time you program text to respond gives you information implicitly about the data you're using. And that's the kind of attacks that have been uh, shown on Interjex. So what is very important for, for you to do is to, uh, to be very careful when you implement code. This is non-trivial because you need to, for instance, do uh, calls that, are, that take constant time. So this way, people cannot guess what, is, uh, what, is, what could be running or what can be the operations behind. So that's a kind of attack and this is, more like um, implementation, uh, it's based on the implementation of the code, but there are attacks like this because uh, there can also be attacks on the hardware. So uh, Intel and Microsoft have to patch a lot, uh, uh, very often uh, the code. So, you know, because, because it's not purely mathematical, you know, there are like a real world problem, like, um, as I said, the time it takes, etc., to attack this. So that's why uh, among the free options, I'd said it's the most uh, vulnerable, but that doesn't mean it's not secure, but we see that compared to the other ones, uh, it's not based on like uh, only a hard problem to solve. So that's uh, the, the, the issue with um, enclaves. Okay, thank you very much. So, so we use uh, enclaves uh, in uh, uh, combination with the other two options or? You can, you, we, we see uh, later that it's a possibility and uh, the both, both, uh, each solution has pros and cons, and you will see what the what very interesting properties of um, of enclaves finish computing is that it's the fastest among the three, and uh, you can run arbitrary code. We we'll see with unmorphic encryption that you cannot run arbitrary code with this, so it's uh, um, it's not always easy to do secure computation uh, with homomorphic encryption or SMPC secure multi-party computation. While in uh, with Enclave, it's really, you drop your Python file, you do zero refactoring, and you can still benefit from the security features. So sure. we'll see. Thank you. Another question before we move on? OK. Then uh, I will, if you have questions, you can ask it at the end. So we'll now talk about homomorphic encryption. So homomorphic encryption is a kind of encryption that is very interesting because uh, the the fundamental idea is that you can encrypt something and people can perform operation on this even if it's encrypted. And so uh, the idea, I don't know if you, I don't know if many of you did uh, a lot of algebra before, but it's based on homomorphism. And homomorphisms are functions that uh, conserve additions and multiplications, which means that if you take uh, X and Y, you encrypt them and you give it to someone else to do the addition, the guy will only see the, the X and Y but uh, after he has it uh, and give it back to you, once you decrypt it, you will see X plus Y. Even though he never saw X, uh, X and Y in clear, but he's able to perform computation for you on encrypted data. And you cannot know what was the input and you cannot know what was the output. And so uh, the fundamental property is that if the encryption and decryption are homomorphisms, then you can give the data to someone else once it's encrypted and you can, you can perform like addition and multiplications on this data. And you cannot know what is, uh, what is what's going on. But once you get the data, you can decrypt this and see the actual result of your computation. So it's a very interesting um, uh, scheme. And actually, uh, it's very secure. As you said, Abdul, uh, this is um, quantum secure, which means that 
even an attack from uh, a computer, uh, a quarter computer, will not be able to break it currently. And so this is something that is uh, quite recent. Well, the idea uh, started back in like the 80s with uh, RSA, but it's only recently, like it's been 10 years ago, that uh, someone, Quagentry, proved that it was uh, theoretically possible. Back then, when he first proved that, it was like uh, not efficient at all. But as you can see on the graph, it's becoming more and more efficient. So it's, uh, it might be a reality soon that we'll use amorphic encryption. And as I said before, this is purely software because it's purely mathematics. You don't need special kind of hardware. So that means that you can use this on your laptop. Uh, I'll show you later, but I will use this on my laptop. While with confidential computing, you need a special kind of hardware. So uh, it's more interesting because it's more like easier to set up uh, compared to the other solutions but we see that it's not perfect. So to see how it works in the, from a high level view, imagine you have uh, some data, a vector, like uh, the vector can be like uh, your face, like uh, an image or uh, something like that. The first thing you do is that you take this vector and you transform it into a polynomial. You may ask why polynomials, why can't I use directly the vector? Well, the thing is uh, polynomials have, uh, polynomial rings have a nice structure that allows to have something that is secure, but also efficient. Uh, for instance, when we will do multiplication, instead of using n squared, we, will, we can uh, using polynomials on the fast Fourier transform. You can do multiplications between polynomials in n log n, so it's uh, more efficient. So, just to, to tell you, it's more efficient to use polynomials. That's why it's used in practice. It's faster and uh, it requires less memory. But so once you once you have your your plain text, which means it's, it's still uh, you can decode it and see exactly the data. Well, once you have the plain text, which is a polynomial, you encrypt it. And then you get the ciphertext. The ciphertext is the encryption of your data. And once you have the ciphertext, you can allow someone to do computation on this, on the ciphertext. And then uh, you give it back to the, to the person who was the owner of the data. He decrypts it, so he gets a plain text. And then you can decode this and get the, the vector, which is the result, like uh, 1 and 0, 0, 0, because uh, your, uh, your class was, uh, your, your, in, your image was uh, of the first class. So that's a high level view of how it works. So we'll see a little bit in detail how it works in practice and especially what is called CKKS, which is a scheme I've worked on, which allows you to work on uh, real numbers. Uh, because uh, with amorphic encryption, uh, you do not necessarily work with real numbers. There are other schemes that work only on integers. So this one is more suited for like machine learning uh, because we need to under like real values. So this one is more uh, yeah, suited. So the idea is that as I said before, you have a vector at first, but at the end, uh, you need to make it into a polynomial. And the way you do this is using a Lagrangian uh, polynomial interpolation. I don't know if you know about this, but it's a way to convert, uh, to have a one-to-one -one, um, function that takes a, a polynomial to a vector and vice versa. And you take your, um, that is that you take your, yeah, your vector and transform it into uh, a polynomial. I will not go into the mathematical decade because there are a lot of this. And actually, I've, I've written articles on this if you're interested to understand how it works. But you just need to know that first you take your vector, you get a polynomial then. And then uh, this is a, more, a funnier part, which is uh, how do you en encrypt this? And the idea is that, as I said before, uh, you start with a secret key that is generated at random. And then from this, you get a public key. So you take uh, the idea is that it's based on the, you, you first have your secret key SK, and then you want to create the public key uh, PK, which is a couple of two polynomials B and A. And the idea is that first you sample A, which is a mask, and then you output B, which is equal to uh, minus A times S plus E, and E is a small uh, random noise. And uh, this is where the quantum secure part uh, comes. So that is that you want to, um, you want to hide SK, but uh, you want to create a public key. And by outputting minus SK plus E, you can, you can output this because uh, the problem is it's, it has been shown that it's very hard to get uh, SK from um, the public key because uh, you have to solve this problem, which is, uh, which is called the learning with error problem, which is finding SK from uh, minus SK plus E. And that's where the quantum uh, secure part uh, comes in, which is solving this problem. So once you have this, what you, uh, the, it's very simple to encrypt something. Imagine you have a message uh, P. So you take P and uh, uh, you take P and you add B, which is what I said uh, earlier, which is a, 
minus a times h k plus e. And uh, you said that the second coordinate, which is simply a, which is the mask we generated before. And this is your, uh, your surface text, which is uh, uh, your message p plus b, and the second coordinate, which is simply a. And to decode this, what, what you only need to do is, um, once you, because you have a secret key, you take, uh, you just apply uh, C0 plus uh, C1 times SK, which is, uh, well, as you see before, minus SK plus E plus P plus A times SK. And the A times SK uh, cancels. And when you have the end is your message plus E, and E is a small uh, noise that, um, that can be ignored in practice. So, well, uh, I, I will have uh, more like um, uh, figures to illustrate this, but that's how it works. You can, as I said, you will, you will, there's, there are more details on, in my blog articles if you want. But uh, what you need to do is that uh, with um, what you can do as operation is addition and multiplication. And we'll see that the, you, need, you need other operations that allow you to uh, keep the noise budget uh, small because uh, the noise, when you do multiplication, will increase. That's a problem with almost conclusion. We need to inject noise to encrypt the data. But the problem is uh, when you um, do multiplication, the noise will increase to the point where it's, uh, you will no longer be able to decrypt the message. And all those operations, all those addition and multiplications are how you, you can uh, manage this noise. So to make it simpler for you, this is like a, a high level view. You have a plain text, which is your message. You add a mask to hide it and you need to inject some noise. So noise will, will always be present and it's for security reasons. Because if you don't add noise, you can uh, find your, you can more easily uh, break the, the surface text. The surface text is your, is, your, is, your, is your encryption. And so after each multiplication you do, the noise will increase. That's, a, that's a, the idea of homomorphic encryption. And the thing is that if you have too much noise, it's impossible to decrypt afterwards. You will not have the correct result. And uh, decryption, if, if uh, the noise has not overflown, is simply removing the mask I told you about. At the end, you have the result plus a small noise. And the idea is that if the noise is not too important, uh, it will not uh, affect too much the finite result. So that's how it works. And now to see how, uh, the, how um, where we are with homomorphic inclusion currently, uh, there have been uh, a paper in 2016 on CryptoNet, which is a, a neural network that is able to perform um, a classification of MNIST data with homomorphic encryption. And uh, it worked rather well with this. And um, there are a few libraries on this. I will give you the most uh, famous one for uh, um, machine learning, which is CKKS, which is implemented in the C library. It's also it's C++, but I will show you later that you have a, a Python alternative. And this library allows you to do like a computation uh, with homomorphic encryption. But uh, Daniel? Yeah. For, for the NIST example, yeah, I mean, uh, what kind of algorithm did they use if, if you are only allowed to do uh, addition and multiplication? Very good question. All right, the thing is, uh, the problem, what are the problems of morphic encryption? In practice, you have a limited number of multiplication. That means you cannot evaluate arbitrarily large neural networks. Uh, second, you cannot use like um, any kind of activation function. You need to use like a polynomial uh, activation functions. In the case of CryptoNet, what they used is um, a square uh, activation function. So actually, what they needed to retrain, so what they did, I don't know, like it's a free layer uh, the neural network. So it was not, a, it was a deeply, uh, uh, yeah, it, it was not a conventional neural network. It was a deeply connected uh, neural network. And so what you can do is that you do the linear operation, which is simply addition multiplications. And then uh, for the non-linearity, you apply a square on the, as an activation function. And they had to train the model with this, with the square and not the like real U or sigmoid. So that's one downside of uh, homomorphic encryption. As I told you before, it's not as expressive as uh, using simply PyTorch, you know? Okay, thanks. Um, so um, just to give you an idea, um, I don't know if you know about um, Onyx, which is a runtime for uh, that allow you to take a model train in PyTorch or in TensorFlow or have something that is generic. So that is that um, there is um, some work on making a compiler for Onyx that allows you to take your model and uh, uh, 
provide uh, another runtime, uh, which uses homomorphic encryption, so that you do not need to actually care about this as a data scientist and make it transparent for you. Well, actually, uh, currently, uh, I've, I've seen uh, this, it's not that easy to use in practice, and uh, you still need expertise currently to use uh, homomorphic encryption in practice. And so, first thing uh, that I want to show you is a demo with Tensil. Tensil is a Python library that uh, allows you to do homomorphic encryption. It's a wrapper around the SIL library that was developed by Microsoft, which uses C++, and in, CAD, in, the, in Tensil, you can use uh, Python. So, uh, I will show you uh, my screen. Okay. Okay, this is a notebook that you can have access to. It's, it's on the, uh, it is on the GitHub of Tensil, if you look at this, but uh, this is an idea of how it works. So the idea is that- uh, Daniel, you can, can you increase a little bit? The uh, like this? Zoom? Yes. <laughs> it's funny because I'm just, is it better like this or not? It... Okay, like this? Yes, like this. Nice. Because before it was in full screen, and now I don't size the, the, the window. Okay, weird. Well, for me, it's better. <laughs> okay. Well, as I said before, the funny thing is that, yeah, you can uh, you can use Torch, etc., to, to have a look at this. Uh, oh, wait, no, not this one. This is, uh, well, this is training with, this is too complicated. Uh, we're going to see uh, the getting started. The second the example I was about to show you is the wrong one. It's uh, how to use, how to train a, a classification model, but uh, we will simply use, a, we will just simply see a, a more uh, a easier uh, example. But this is the idea, it gives you an idea of how it works. Um, so the idea is that uh, Tensil is not that hard to use. Uh, as you can see, you can use Python and then look on this. And that is that they provide you like, uh, you need to set up a few things to use it first. Uh, usually what you can do is just like uh, copy paste the uh, parameters that are set up for you. And the idea is that first uh, you will create a context that, that will manage uh, everything. You don't need to, well, uh, for instance, do you need a public key and a private key or only a private key? That kind of things. And that's not the funny thing. Okay, let's see something from you. Here we can take uh, a plain vector. Here we, use, we do not use a CKKS, we use a BFV. It only works on integers, but it will be the same. And the idea is that here we create uh, the plain text vector, we encrypt it, and uh, uh, we can uh, we will do some operations it. So the first thing is like, okay, we take the encrypted vector and we add something to this, and then we decrypt this. And because this was the initial uh, input, and this is uh, the output, you see that we are able to do much, uh, additions. And uh, between something that's encrypted and non-encrypted, and once we decrypt this, we have the correct result. Actually, you can do uh, like uh, subtractions, and as I said before, you can also do multiplication. And uh, well, you can do uh, you can take something that uh, that was a result that uh, that, uh, uh, that was calculated before, which is like I first I did the addition and then the, the subtraction. And then I add the two ciphertext and I still get the correct result. And as you saw before, you can do uh, uh, yeah, um, subtraction, multiplication, and all. And you can have a look at, for instance, uh, the time it takes uh, to multiply something that has, uh, it, it, it is long. You can, you can take something that is encrypted and do operation with something that is not encrypted, or you can take something that is encrypted and multiply it with something that is also encrypted. But if you take two things that are encrypted, it will be slower. You see, yeah, it, it's uh, two things that are already encrypted. It's it's slow. If you have something that is encrypted and not encrypted, it will be faster. But this gives you a little idea of how it works, um, uh, and how homomorphic encryption works. But uh, now for the uh, to do something that is a lot funnier, I will show you. Uh, okay, uh, let me go back to the slide. Um, da, da, da. Um, okay, stop sharing. Um, so, wait. Okay, 
Well, that was a pencil. You can have a look at this. There is a GitHub. There is a big uh, open source community around this, and it's it's done by OpenMind. OpenMind is a yeah, it's open source community that is launched by a former data scientist. No, it's still a data scientist at DeepMind, but it's a very interesting community. And they have a, they have a lot of resources on the MOOC, on etc. So it's very interesting if you have, if you want to have a look. And so the next thing we're going to see is actually something that I've worked on during my internship at Microsoft which is how do you evaluate um, a decision tree on, uh, with homomorphic encryption? Because uh, as I said before, as uh, Mark pointed it, it, it kind of sucks if you can only do uh, a limited number of multiplication. Uh, and, uh, actually, you can only uh, evaluate polynomial activation functions. And also, uh, I didn't show you that, but doing matrix multiplication is not that easy either. So you have a lot of problems and you might think, okay, that's cool, but if I can only do linear regression, like what's the point? So my idea is that how can we use something that we know, which is decision trees, and adapt this so that it works with homomorphic encryption. And I'm not going into the detail of this. Uh, I, I wrote a paper on this and you can find uh, it uh, on my GitHub. But the idea is that fundamentally, uh, a decision tree can be seen as a neural network with three layers. The first layer will do the comparisons. And then based on the result of comparisons, you can guess what leaf uh, your observation belongs to. And based on this, the third layer will say, OK, what is the, the distribution of uh, this last uh, of the leaf that you belong to? And the idea is that, you implement, uh, that I implemented this efficiently in homomorphic encryption, because uh, there is a way uh, to do this efficiently. And that's what I have been uh, I worked on. And I will show you how it works in practice. So uh, OK. Um, let me share my screen once again. Uh, da, 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 da. Share screen. Mm. Okay. So. Okay. Here I will show you first the how can I say the um, experience, like the user experience that you will see, and afterward I will see how it works in practice. So here uh, I've loaded. Um, a server that has a model that is already trained on as an adult income data set, which is a data set uh, where you have like a socioeconomic uh, variables. And the goal is to predict whether someone earns more than 50,000 a year. And so this is the server is already working. The model is already loaded. And now what I will simply do is uh, I will run the client. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, StreamRit, but it's a very cool uh, Python library that allows you to. Um, to run demos and you write it uh, exclusively in, uh, in Python. So it's cool. And so uh, here it is. This is a demo. Um, so here you can uh, modify this uh, if you want. I'm not going to modify it too much, but you know, this is the adult income data set that, that you know of. If you figure out it, it contains a lot of personal information, that, that so that's quite um, sensible. And the idea is that from the client point of view, he has his data. He wants to encrypt this, so I will encrypt the data. So I have uh, some data that CTX. If I if I open this, you would just see like garbage, battery, and stuff like that. But you have to trust me that actually what I have done is take this data and encrypt it. it. And now from the server point of view, I will simply need to. Uh, I didn't want to do like a, a kind of. I didn't want to do the network interface, but you have to imagine uh, it's as if uh, it was sent on the real uh, the network. Then I apply the model on the encrypted data. So the server does not see the data, but can still do computation on this. Computation is done. So now I would simply uh, decrypt the data. And well, this is uh, the probability that the guy uh, earned more than 50K. And if you look at this uh, based on the, on the initial feature, it makes sense because, uh, for instance, uh, he only went until like, a, like, he doesn't even have a high school diploma, stuff like that. So actually, it makes sense. That's not the point of the score, but the point is, it's possible to take your data, encrypt this, give it to someone else. The guy actually is um, the model that was used by the server is actually a random forest, and so that's what uh, that was. But that that's what was used, and you can actually get the result and see uh, the output of the model without having to show actually what was the data. And to see uh, how I did that in practice, uh, okay, I will send. I show you. Uh, 
And here, oh. how are you sure that this is uh, your random forest algorithm that is running? You have to trust uh, the yeah. server. The, well, yeah, well, yeah, the thing is, you have to trust the server, but at the worst case scenario, it just gives you a, a junk model that gives you uh, shitty uh, predictions, but it never shows you data. So, okay. you know, so. Uh, no, okay, there is already one server. Okay. Okay. So uh, actually, I don't know if you know this, but um, Mark and I are huge fans of uh, FastAI, and they have a library called um, um, what's the name of this? NBDev that allows you to do, develop your libraries, but with notebooks. Just for just for the fun of it, I will show you how it works. But the idea is that you. Uh, you can develop in notebooks and you can export the cells of the data that interest you. And the funny thing is that uh, it's a good thing for documentation so that people can actually look at your code, but uh, you can put it in a notebook. So you can, you know, instead of just having comments, you can actually show what is happening inside. And you can still export this into like a clean Python library that you can use afterwards. That's something that's what I use. But so uh, how did it work in behind the scene? Uh, was in examples. Okay. So, um, also you can find this on my GitHub. So the, how, did, how did I do this in practice? So the first thing is I had the model and I, I had the data from, um, yeah, the identity data dataset. Then I did some pre-processing, as you know. Uh, well, for, for this to work, you need to do some pre special pre-processing, but it doesn't matter. So the first thing we do is, um, uh, you take a random forest from scikit-learn, like you know, a regular random forest. Then what you do is uh, you wait. Where is it? Uh, da, 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 da. No. Okay. Well, maybe it. Oh yeah, here it is. Well, yeah, you you take um, the random forest, the scikit-learn random forest, and then you, you, you take the neural random forest, which is a, an approximation that is using uh, neural networks to, um, to approximate a, a regular random forest with a, a neural one. That's the first thing. Then the problem is that uh, because we approximate this with, um, how can I say, polynomials for, as activation functions and all, it's not exactly the same thing. So you need to fine tune this. So that's what I did here. And once you have this, once you have your neural, neural random forest, you convert this into an amorphic random forest. So that's what I did here. Uh, and here I will use uh, the library. Here you see, uh, uh, I take the, um, uh, I create an amorphic random, uh, an homomorphic neural random forest. And then uh, simply what I do is then uh, I take the, some data, for instance, I encrypt this, and then I evaluate my, uh, my random forest on the data. And uh, I can decode this. And for instance, you can see that uh, the neural random forest and the homomorphic one have uh, similar outputs. So it's quite similar. You see that it's not exactly the same because as I told you, there is noise that is injected and the noise will increase. So it's not exactly the same thing, but uh, most of the time it's pretty close. Uh, Daniel? Yes? J just to be sure, here you are uh, learning first uh, psychic learn random forest on the data yes. set. Mm -hmm. So this is the first learning. Then you you transform it in a, with a random network forest. Yeah, and you are I mean you are fine tuning. It's a kind of fine tuning. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I do for some fine tuning at the end, so, and so then at the for, end uh, for, for the, the random network case. I mean, uh, do you do the training on the on the data set also, or on the or you try to fit? The prediction of the random forest. Now uh, I do the thing. Uh, well, the, what I'm using is based on on some work by, by one of your professor, which is Erwan Scorney, and uh, he did a, he wrote a paper around how to approximate uh, random forest with neural random forest. And the thing is, what you usually do is uh, after that you can fine tune like a, not not to uh, what can I say to try to imitate the result of the previous uh, random forest. But to increase the neural random forest, because the idea is that using by using a random forest as a starter, it gives you a cold start. That means that you you, can, you kind of have 
the, uh, the same performance as the random forest initially, but then you can fine tune it to have even better performance than the initial random forest. So that's the idea of the thing. So as you said, first thing, I train random forest. I take this random forest, I transform it into a neural random forest. I fine tune it uh, a little bit more. Uh, on the same data set. On the same data set. Okay. But then I take this neural random forest and I just like take the like Python object and transform it into the homomorphic random uh, forest that you know needs to work with uh, homomorphic conclusion. And also I, I had to, uh, to add some like um, optimization to make it work. And once you have this, you have the homomorphic random forest and you can actually use that uh, on uncoded input. Okay, thank you, that's clear. And so after that, uh, what I simply did is like, yeah, I exported uh, the data, like uh, uh, I dumped uh, the thing and I loaded it afterwards. Uh, for inference, like uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, this is like um, just Python stuff. So that's, you can, that's how you can actually use a random forest on the included input. And that was what I worked on at Microsoft. Uh, and you can see the paper if you're more interested. Uh, okay, let me get back to the slides. Okay, share screen. Okay. Uh, so that, that's a more frequent question. As I, as I said, uh, you can find more things on like, uh, uh, for instance, I, I've wrote uh, a series of articles. It's it's available on uh, Tours of the Science, so that you can have more information on how it works in practice. It's it's quite uh, like easy to understand in the sense that I really try to make it uh, uh, easy to understand. And also, you can code it in Python from scratch. So it's it's like uh, doing uh, coding yourself a, a neural network in Python. So it's uh, quite guided, and you can have some fun like using this. And yeah, it's, it's a lot of. Um, Resources from Microsoft because this is something that uh, that has been uh, pushed by Microsoft, especially CKS. Uh, but you can find uh, a lot of resources uh, if you uh, if you want afterwards. And so now for the last um, technology, uh, this is something I worked a little bit less, but I can still present it to you. It's called multi-party computation. And so the idea is that you have several parties. Like some people have data, some people have a function. And the idea is that you have, we have someone, an operator which will not necessarily see the data, but it will help each party to do computation together. And the idea is that everyone will participate in the computation, and, but no one will actually see uh, what was the other party's data. And this gives you an idea. Imagine that you have uh, like uh, two hospitals that have data and like um, they want to do some computation together and someone has a model and the idea is that in multi-party multi computation, you do, not, you do not have keys, but you have what we call shares. So that is that you take your data or your model and you split it into shares. And the idea is that is do, if you don't have the two shares, you cannot, do, you cannot know what was the initial data. So actually, if you only send one share to someone, it's safe. It's really hard to find what was the initial data just based on one share. And the idea is that uh, you exchange shares with other people. Like when Alice Ebo can exchange shares of the of their own data, and then they apply the model on the shares. And the idea is that at the end, if you want to know what was the output, you combine the shares together, and then you, you get the final output, as if the model was directly applied on the data. But actually, at no time, each, each party saw what the other had. Wait, just a moment, I have to come back. I have Okay, sorry. Um, so how does it work in practice? As I said, you can have up to like n people, and uh, as long as uh, you can, as uh, even if you have n minus one people that collaborate together to try to know what was your data, they cannot know what was your data because uh, you will need uh, you, there is like a third party that provides randomized shares, which is like random numbers, so that uh, each each person can hide their data to the other parties. But if this operator, this third party, collaborates with the n minus one people, then they can, uh, if together they can know what, was, what had the, the, last, the last person. But what is very interesting with secure multi-party computation is that you don't have the constraints of homomorphic encryption. That means that 
can perform as many operations as you want, as many multiplication as you want. You can do max pooling, you can do like um, comparisons. So it's much more expressive than home of conclusion. And to give you an idea of how it works, imagine you have one party has X, one party has Y, and you want to compute X times Y. The idea is that the third party will generate uh, A, B, and A times B, and you will distribute the shares to other person. And because, um, because uh, there are random numbers, we can compute in the open X plus A and Y plus B, because A and B serve as noise, so you, can, you don't actually show X, but you can show X plus A and Y plus B. And the idea is that if you want to compute X times Y, so this you do a little trick. You do, uh, you see, as we saw before, uh, in the first line, X plus A minus A and Y plus B minus B. And the thing is, then you develop this. And you see that actually what you need to compute X times Y is X plus A, Y plus B, B, A, and A times B. But as X plus A and Y plus B, as we said before, are random. Uh, and, and not random, but um, like mask the contribution of X and A. And A and B are just random numbers. So actually, uh, you can, it's possible to uh, compute X times Y without each party showing uh, what they had, because as I said, there is a third party that provides random numbers to hide uh, your contribution to the computation. So there are a lot of um, MPC protocols that are out there. Actually, there is one that is used in uh, OpenMind that is called SecureNN. So um, um, it's, it allows to do like a, both training and inference and encrypted data together. And there are like other like uh, schemes such as uh, INN that's developed by uh, ONS, or also Crypto4 that is here, for instance. And Crypto4, as, uh, as Abdul said, is still interesting because they use uh, enclaves uh, in the process because um, it has this, this using, if you use SMPC, you can have security, but you do not necessarily have integrity. That means that someone can like try to like uh, sabotage the computation. It will not know what your input was, but uh, the output will be wrong. And the idea that if you use uh, enclaves, you can actually secure this part. And you can also use enclaves as the trusted third party that will generate random numbers. So if you use enclaves, you can make sure that the, the random number generator will not collude, uh, collide with uh, any party. So that's an interesting thing. And as you said, uh, you can combine some solutions together. And uh, in that case, in SMPC is particularly suited for multi-party uh, collaboration. So you can imagine a lot of scenarios like um, product set intersection, collaborative machine learning, just as with uh, confidential computing and other things. And just to wrap this up uh, before we, we have more Q&A. So we saw the three techniques, confidential computing, which uses hardware, Amorphic compression that uses only software and secure multi, -party, secure multi party computation that can use both depending on how you implement this. And we saw that in terms of performance, confidential computing is the most interesting. Amorphic encryption is uh, probably the less efficient but, uh, and also the less uh, expressive of the three. SMPC, I did not tell you about this, but you have to communicate a lot. I showed you that you have to, to send shares to everyone. And you need to communicate a lot when you use SMPC. So that's a big downside of uh, SMPC. In terms of privacy, uh, they're based on different things. Confidential computing uses trusted hardware. Homophobic encryption is just based on uh, encryption. And SMPC needs encryption, but also non collision with uh, some actors. And confidential computing and homophobic encryption are well suited for a server side, where you have a, a client with a, a little uh, computation resources. And you, uh, you send all the computation to a server. It's possible with uh, confidential computing and homophobic encryption. But with SMPC, because the client needs to participate in the computation, uh, it's not, uh, you see that you cannot, uh, you cannot expect uh, like, uh, uh, like a smartphone to uh, compute with you a GP2 free inference. You know? So it's not always uh, you know, usable in practice because of this constraint. And the problem of confidential computing, as we said, is that because it's only hardware, there are no attacks on this. There are also like known defenses, but maybe I would say it's the least secure. I mean, I would say it's not secure, but it's the least secure among the three. While those two are because they're based on more like um, uh, hard problems, they are more secure in that, in that regard. So the pros and cons of uh, confidential computing is that it's fast, it's easy to use. You don't need to refactor your code, but uh, there can be attacks. Homophobic encryption is the easiest one to use. There's little setup. 
You don't need uh, to have like a trusted uh, third party. You don't need to have hardware. You just need like a server and a client. But as I told you before, it's the less expressive one. So you cannot evaluate everything with this. And also, if you think, if you think about this, when I showed you the training, training was done, what, the training was done on plain text. That means you cannot do training on um, encrypted data. You can only do inference with uh, homomorphic encryption. And finally, SMPC uh, uh, is an interesting solution as well because you can do training and inference. But as I said, uh, you need, uh, there are other security issues. You need no, non-collision. And also, uh, you need more like a bandwidth to use that in practice. So yeah, if you want to have something that uh, shows you the strongest point of each, performance would be the strongest point of computational computing. Homomorphic encryption, homomorphic encryption is really secure. And uh, for the collaboration part, uh, secure, multi, secure multi party computation is a good solution. So that's uh, the end of the talk. And I'm open for questions if you have some.